Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. I'm your host, as always, Christopher Brown. Uh, as you've noticed, the last two weeks we were on hiatus. Uh, there was a bit of a personal issue that we had to deal with, but now we are back, we are ready, and we've got some great interviews lined up. We have some great interviews from people from all walks of life, and I can't wait for you to hear them. As always, every Saturday morning, they will be re- a new episode will be released, but also... I will say this uh, up front. We do have uh, a special week coming up. At the end of October, we will be going into Women's Week as October is Women's Month. I wanted to sit down with some great women and talk about uh, issues that are facing women today and celebrate them. Celebrate who women are and what they've done for this society and this world. So look forward to that. Uh, But let's look at today's episode. Today's episode is with the man with the best beard in Alberta politics. This man was the MLA for Beaumont Leduc and the Minister of Municipal Affairs starting in 2017, but he was elected in 2015 under the Rachel Notley government. Shay Anderson and I talk about politics, how he balanced his work life and personal life, his life after politics, and the state of politics today in Canada and here in Alberta. We have a frank conversation, an open conversation, and honestly, it was fantastic. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Cross Border Interviews featuring Shay Anderson. Sort of listen to the people who made decisions and listen to people who were in positions where they could make uh, decisions and also cut through the whole 140 characters. <laughs> yeah. I'm sick and tired of finding, listening to politicians, one in particular, that likes to tweet with 140 characters or 280 characters. So <laughs> I just want to stop that and get into the whole face-to-face conversation thing. So thank you very much for doing this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no problem. Um, I guess my first question, this is the first question I ask all uh, politicians, is where did your sense of duty come from? Where did your sense of duty to put your name forward come from? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I think, you know what? It's funny, years ago, my dad said something to me. My dad doesn't, he's not a big talker like me. I talk a lot and my, my kids do, right? And my wife kind of always makes fun of us for it. But uh, my dad's not a big talker. And I remember years ago, he had said something that uh, it always kind of stuck with me. And he said, if you're not going to take care of the people around you, then what are you here for? And it was kind of one of those things where he's just like, we grew up on a small hobby farm. Everybody around us, we knew. And we always helped each other. We always did when we were hand or if, you know, there was chickens that had to be, you know, brought in and whatever it was, we always helped each other. And so that's what he meant, right? And doing that type of thing. And he always coached and, and growing up, I started to kind of do a bit of that. As I got older, I kind of, I was always interested in politics and, and mom and dad always said, we don't care who you vote for just be informed and, and, you know, it's a privilege to vote. So I always kind of had those things in the back of my mind and always paid attention. Moved to Alberta from BC in 2004 and heard that we hadn't changed governments here in, at that point, I mean, it's decades, right? And I was surprised and, uh, you know, taken aback a bit. And then, you know, seeing what was going on and reading about things that were going on with, with politics, uh, I really got frustrated by it. And I felt like... Everybody would shrug and, and say, well, that's a politician. They lie and there's scandals. And thought, that's not right. You know, that to me, that is wrong. Like we should demand better. So what really drove me, I think, was when, for, with my kids. I, I looked at them and I thought, you know what? I don't want to just sit on the sideline. I, want, I don't want to be one of those people on Twitter that just gets mad about stuff all the time. It doesn't do anything. So I actually reached out to my local EDA and, and I was just going to go volunteer. I thought, you know what? I've never done this before. Let's go volunteer. And about an hour into a conversation with our president, he had said, do you want to run? And I, yeah. And I, I kind of, I was like, you know, I was a little bit shocked that he said that. And, but he said, listen, you're very, you know, interested in this. You seem to know a lot about what's going on in the area. Uh, And at that point, they'd never had somebody for the NDP run in this riding. It was always somebody, well, they had people run, but it was always somebody from, uh, yeah, from the city or something, right? So it, it was interesting for them to have somebody that lived here. 
and because I had kids and you knew the riding and played sports here and kind of were involved, it was a, a big deal. So, so you know, wait, before we go further, why the NDP though? Was that was that something your father? <coughs> uh, sort of. He, he said that you said that he they never said who you should vote mm-hmm. for, but you should be involved and vote. Yeah. But was the NDP and uh, because I know in BC it's a little bit different and sure. liberal are sort of a little they're federally they may seem close but in BC they're further apart <laughs> yeah so, a liberal in BC is a conservative exactly and yeah. NDP it seems like you're more liberal slash uh, NDP-ish so where did that come from for you when you came to Alberta and you said mm-hmm. okay, well I'm going to stick with the NDP or was it I'm going to look before I decide yeah no no I was NDP 100% you know my labor background uh, for one and, and growing up blue collar like we didn't grow up with much money but pretty much everybody I knew uh, back home worked in, in forestry in some respect right so all hard working people you know all have been through a lot and, and so for me the values and, and what the NDP represented was always something that stuck with me right it was like yeah you're, you're fighting for working people that people that just want to try to pay the bills and feed their family and stuff like that so it kind of always stuck with me uh, and so you know it was kind of interesting actually after I got elected uh, like I said my dad doesn't talk a lot and we started getting into history stuff and he said oh yeah Tommy Douglas was our MP and I said excuse me so from the couch in Valley after he left Saskatchewan he went out there for one term yep. so I was born in 75 and he was our MP at that time so I said to my dad I'm like well no wonder we were NDP the whole time right like you know it kind of it kind of made me laugh and I thought that was pretty funny but I think at one point um, growing up, uh, our riding had gone liberal like one time or something like that. It was a local guy, and I remember him. Um, yeah, I think, I don't know if he had one or two terms, I can't remember. But other than that, it was NDP the whole time anyway. And then till this time, the, the provincial, they went green. Wow. Yeah. And she was a local person that had done a lot of the environment and stuff and, and, you know, kind of worked hard. So I understood it. But yeah, no, when I came here, it was... Uh, Pretty straightforward. It, yeah. I, I mean, the conservatives here, I mean, yeah, there's some people like PC that are more to the P side. Uh, yeah, fair. I got, you know, we're going to have more in common with that. Um, Um, But the hardcore right wing fiscal conservative stuff that was going on that, you know, profit above everything else really did not sit well with me. And, you know, I just couldn't I could never be that way. It's not who I am. I don't do these. I didn't do these types of things to try to make money and get my face in the paper. You know, like even though it was kind of fun getting your face in the paper, I could clip it and send to my mom, which was funny. But um, but yeah, my values were their NDP. So you you moved here in twenty. 2004. Uh, what, what time? So 2013, 2014. You're starting to have conversations with the local EDA about potentially running in 2015. Yeah, it was. Um, you know what? It actually wasn't that long before. I want to say it was 2014. It was probably in. Geez, I'll screw this up. I would say late summer of 20 2014. Probably so this, at this time, Brian Mason is still the leader. Yeah, was you know what? I think it was. Geez, when I can't remember when Rachel became leader there. Whatever. I remember, I remember interviewing her. Yeah. So so Brian, yeah, Brian was still the leader. Yeah, and then so I started kind of paying attention a little more because of what was going on in the party. That's right. That's kind of what yeah. what spurred it a bit. I remember, and there was a leadership campaign with the two of them, uh, or well, with really? no, yeah, with uh, David and Rod and and Rachel, right? And and uh, it was interesting to see what was going on. So that. That's when, yeah, that's kind of when I thought, hey, well, things are changing around here. People are talking. And, and so it spurred me to reach out. So did you talk to your family at this time, too? Because this is a big commitment that you're yeah. putting your family through. Well. Yeah, we talked about it. And well, because I thought I was just going to go volunteer at first, <laughs> my wife was like, oh, sure, that's cool. Like, you know, what does that entail? I said, I don't know until I go and check it out. Yeah. Like, who knows? Right. I know door knocking and I know this, but um, I didn't know what the time, like how much time and then when I came back so the funny thing is so so the president asked me if I wanted to run and I thought geez okay well let me talk to Kelly about this 
And so I went away. And the funny part is, is my, so I was a VP of my union at my local and shop steward. So I come back and I was leaving. I think I was leaving the next day for our convention in Vancouver. So I talked to my wife and I said, okay, well, let me think about it. Like, let's figure out what this is going to be. So I get to the convention in Vancouver. And of course, our president of the whole union knows because I've talked to him. Right. And I get up to the mic the first time in front of hundreds and hundreds of people. And he's like, oh, this is Shea Anderson, you know, he's from Alberta. And, uh, oh, by the way, did you guys know he's going to run for the NDP in the election? And the whole crowd went crazy, of course, and, the, and they were cheering and screaming. And I was like, well, I guess my decision's made. So I kinda, it was kind of a funny way that it happened, actually. So, so you come back from the convention. Uh, the leadership happens for the NDP. There isn't supposed to be an election called be- call mm-hmm. spring of 2015. So you're thinking you have time to get a totally. door knock. Yep. And then all of a sudden, Prentice drops the ball. Yeah. We're going to an election. Yeah. That's up in arms for you. So... How, take me through the process of, okay, I need to start door knocking. I need to get a campaign team. Because yeah. At that time, no one thought the NDP were going to form government. Oh, for sure. So yeah. what was the process for you to go from that day the election was called to election night? Was yeah. it easy for you? Was it easy to get people on your side? Yeah. You know what? It was, it was interesting. It, it was weird. Yeah. Because we didn't think well, we kind of started suspecting that he might call it right i mean but we didn't we didn't think he would yeah right with everything that was kind of going on we're like wow this would be silly right like it wouldn't be a great time um and so that being said though the campaign team that i had so the eda here was a bunch of folks that have been here for a long time like through thick and thin and just like good salt of the earth people right like just awesome and you know i show up with this giant beard and they're like who the heck is this guy like what the hell is going on, right? Typical politics. Yeah, right? So they're like, what have we got ourselves into? But they quickly realized that I'm pretty down to earth, right? And so the team was just like, well, we got to be ready, right? And so they would, they had kind of been used to campaigning before, right? So I was lucky there was probably a good core of... I don't know, about 10 to 12 people, right? It wasn't a lot, but that had been around. So when, uh, after Christmas, we started talking and we, and we started hearing rumblings, right? Like, oh, geez, they might call it. Oh, okay. We, so we actually just started having good regular meetings and saying, well, what if they call it? What are we going to do? Yeah. And yeah, like I was lucky. Uh, Gary Hansen was our president here at the time and he'd been around forever and just takes no prisoners. You know, he was, but it was a teacher forever, good organizer, labor labor guy. And, and I think that's part of what it was too. We had some good labor people that were kind of used to organizing. Um, and also my steelworker uh, union, the, the TW and USW guys and ladies were phenomenal. They brought us, uh, you know, brought us together and kind of taught us how to organize and how to get out. So I think it was a big team effort, but it, still it was scary as hell. Like, I was going to say, <laughs> during that election, I, I, I was the campaign manager for Danielle uh, and we, we, at the beginning, it was tough. Knocking on doors, mm-hmm. just didn't have the time of day. Um, but slowly, as the campaign came along, mm-hmm. Rachel was doing better and better, and it seemed the polls numbers for the NDP were rising. At what moment during the election, that election period, did you say, we could actually win this thing? Yeah, it's funny because <laughs> so when my president first asked me yeah. if I would run, <clears throat> he had said, oh, you're not going to win anyway. <laughs> And I always, I always joked with them, right? And, and as soon as we got elected, then I became a minister. It was like, hey, remember when you said I would never get, you know, I was never going to get elected? And he said it not one time. It was numerous times over the months, right? <laughs> Leading kind of up to it. He's like, don't worry, don't worry. We're just going to go out and do this thing. We got to make sure we represent. Yeah. And so, so it was kind of funny, um, you know, that he said that. So I didn't, I guess I didn't feel that much pressure at the beginning, right? Yeah. But, you know, I'd always said like, well, okay, what's the worst that's going to happen? I'll lose, but I'll learn a hell of a lot, right? And show my kids you stand up for what you believe in. So I was like, okay, cool, let's do this. But it kind of as it went on, like the doors were, they were pretty good, to be honest. There wasn't um, the the rampant vitriol that there was this last election, right? All this garbage misinformation and shit that was going on out there that was just unacceptable, right? Um, I mean, granted, they wouldn't really do that to me at the door because I'm a big guy and they don't, you know, it's intimidating, right? And, yeah. um, which shouldn't have to be, which is, is ridiculous, but it, it's kind of a thing. But I would say 
I didn't say it to people, but I had a feeling, right? We were starting to go and I could tell the other guy, I saw him in, in Tim Hortons one day, the previous MLA. And he went in there cause it was all the old folks that were in there. Typical. Typical. And he, and he wasn't knocking on doors. And he said, one of the old guys I remember saying, Hey, who's your competition? And he said, I don't have any. And I was, I don't know, 10 feet away. And I went, oh, okay, here we go. Right. And I played sports all my life. Yeah. I'm not going to back down from a challenge. And so it was about, I think it was about a month out from the election. So between the time he said that and then about another month, we were in almost the same position. And the same question came up from somebody. And I heard him say, that's him right there. That's Shay. And I'm like, that's right. You son of a gun. Like, this is gonna, uh, this is what we're gonna do here. And I felt like about a month out, I'm like, we're gonna win this. Yeah, like I felt good because I was going to the door and people were. Did were, people start recognizing you? Oh, yeah. Hey, you're the beard guy. Yeah. The Ton- beard. And because I worked uh, for TELUS at the time and I'd worked for Shaw before, I'd been in lots of houses. People knew me from that too. Yeah. And they're like, hey, I know who you are. And oh, yeah, you did this. And you, even to this, you know, to like the last four years to the day that uh, the next election, people. People would say, I know you put my cable in my house, you know, like, so people knew me from that, but I found that even the, the kind of the messages that we were sending were resonating, right? People were tired of the politicians that were just lying to them all the time. And me coming to the door with this big beard and just kind of a guy that's just like, I'm not going to BS you. I'm always going to be honest. I'm going to drink beers with you. Like, this is who I am. It started resonating. So I never said anything to the EDA. I didn't really, I, I didn't, you kept it I kept internal with myself because I was like, I think we're going to win this. You know, but I felt. It must be a conversation you must have been having with your family. Like, if I we, was, if yeah. we win this, this, yeah. this is a whole new life for us. Well, that's what I said. I, I said to her, I'm like, what do we do? And she's like, you go with it. Right? Like, what do you mean? What do you do? Right? And I said, well, I don't know how this is going to change. Like the amount of hours, it's going to be crazy. And she said, that's fine. We'll do what we have to do. You know, like you're trying to help people. That's what you want to do. Let's go. And so, yeah, it was, um, it was weird. Honestly, it was, uh, it was exciting, but it was nerve wracking. Even thinking about it right now, I can feel myself getting, you know, all fired up about it. Cause it was, uh, these elections oh, man. comes through May 5th. You're declared winner. Yeah. What's the first thought you go? Oh, I was freaking out. I didn't take the next day off work. <laughs> Because you thought I forgot about it. I, I, I kind of forgot because I took a bunch of time off work and yeah. I didn't think like everybody's like, oh, you're not going to win. You're not going to win. I had a feeling, you know, that I was going to, but also didn't really think like I was kind of like, nah, that's no way. You know, it's, it's Alberta. It's been like this forever. You know, yeah. it's not going to change. And who am I? I'm just a guy. Right. And so that night we were at, um, we were at a bar in, in Leduc and had tons of supporters there. And I had supporters there that you hadn't seen before. Like, yeah, there's a bunch of people. Yeah. Okay. This is this is unusual. Yeah, there was a few people that came by that I I didn't know. Um, knew you know some of the people that I was working with on the team and stuff, uh, but people that I didn't know. And, and I at the time I had invited the uh, the Green Party and the Alberta Party guy to come by because they they didn't have anything going on. He said, "Oh, you swing by, have a beer or whatever," and and just kind of hang out. So they brought a couple of people too. And it was kind of interesting because the excitement was building and my phone, we walked in and within 30 minutes, my phone was dead because so many people were calling and texting and trying to get a hold of me because they could see what was going on on TV. And then all of a sudden, boom, my face popped up on the bottom because I was winning. And I was uh, freaking out a bit. <laughs> to be honest, I was, I, I didn't know my wife was like, oh my God, what do we do? Right? <laughs> like, <laughs> holy crap. And so, yeah. And my, the president was freaking out and the members. He's telling like, you this whole time, you're not going to win. Oh yeah. <laughs> and they were, it was funny because they had the, we are the beard. They had these t-shirts and they had big fake beards on. And it was kind of like, we were just having fun, right? Like whatever, that's one of the, my favorite things about it was the fact that all of us were still having fun with it. You know, it wasn't, there wasn't wasn't that much pressure on us, right? Yeah. And so, I, yeah, there wasn't, but I didn't want to lose. Good Lord. No. I, mean, <laughs> I hate so losing. May 5th comes around, you get elected. Mm-hmm. First NDP government. Yeah. This is historic. Yeah. This, like, who, who would have ever thought that? 
So you meet your 53 other colleagues for the very first time. Mm-hmm. What's the what's the atmosphere like at that first meeting? Was it, holy crap, we have a lot of stuff on our shoulders now? Mm-hmm. Or is it, you know what, let's go out and do this? Yeah. You know, it was uh, it was interesting because it's like the next morning, I never took the time off work, right? So I was back at TELUS and Anna Maria Tremonti phones me from CBC National. And I'm like, who the hell is this phone to me? And I'm standing in my office in Leduc, like waiting. And I'm like, hello? And it's her on air, right? And there's people to this day that are like, I still remember that. Wow. The, the you talking to her there. And so nobody in the party had called me. Nobody, like, of course, I didn't know who I was, right? I was this relative no name. So I, I think <laughs> like a lot of us felt like that. For the first couple of days after, we were like, what the hell do we do now? Who do we talk to? How do I, I don't know anybody. You know, I knew some of the people a little bit, but not, not that well, because I wasn't from Alberta originally, right? So when we first met, I remember, remember going in and Anderson. So I'm first at everything, right? So everything's going on. I'm the first guy and everybody's like, hey, uh, hey," you know, and so it was kind of interesting. Aaron Babcock was, she was right beside me because she's a B. So everything we did, actually, the two of us, she's like, oh my God, I'm following you, Shay. I'm following you. And, And so her and I became pretty close right away. But yeah, I think we, when we got in there, I remember sitting in government house and looking around at everybody and looking down at the sign that said my name on it. And taking a picture of it and, go, and sending it to my mom and dad and being like, holy shit, like, this, is real. this is real, man. Here we are. And <clears throat> Rachel coming in and we were just like, like feeling her presence come in, right? It was just like, ah, my God, this is so cool. This is exciting. But then you're right. That feeling of uh, shit now we got to do this, right? Like, what, what are we going to do first? What, are, you know, what are we going to work on? Right. And, and so I, it didn't take long. Uh, I mean, she obviously, Rachel was like, okay. We need to enjoy this, obviously, right? Yeah. But we have stuff to do. And uh, it didn't take long after that where we just started going, okay, well, what do we work on first? Yeah. Right? And it went around at first, like everybody, you know, introduced themselves, obviously, and, and try to get to know each other a little <laughs> bit because most of us didn't know each other. But then... Most of you, honestly, let's be honest, didn't expect to be there. No, for sure. 100%. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. A lot of us were doing it because we believed in it and wanted to put our names up because, you know, we thought it was the right thing to do. But for sure... You know, like getting elected like that, we didn't, it wasn't like this whole, um, you know, it it used to be for the PCs. It was like, okay, well, you ran for town council and then you became the mayor and then you became the ML. It was this this transition. Well, for us, nope. A group of (laughs) just average Yeah. Average people that just wanted to try to do good, you know, by the, by people in their communities. Right. So did you, Everyone I talk to has different feelings on this. Did you feel the negative negativity towards the new government early on? Because this was a change for Albert. Mm-hmm. And when uh, I saw it from my perspective, because I was an outsider looking in, and I saw people on Twitter, people on mm-hmm. Facebook starting to say, you're going to destroy Alberta. Yep. So how did you push that aside and say, you know what, we're not going to listen to those people. Yeah. We just need to focus on what we were, do, or we were elected to do and govern and make it better for everyone. You know, it was, um, it was weird for me to see a lot of the negativity. It was odd. I, I wasn't... I wasn't used to that. Like even, you know, growing up on the island, when you were with a different party, there wasn't that that hate and that like just like, oh my God, you're gonna you're gonna kill us all, right? Like it was it just never was like that. Like we had differences of opinions on politics, that's fine. And it's the way it should be. You should be able to do that stuff. So it was weird for me. You know, I didn't really get it. I was like, why? And then you know, one of the first things actually that happened was uh, my Facebook. I didn't think about locking it down and being private. Like, why, why the hell would I? I was just a guy, like, you know, and, yeah. and, and there was a person from Beaumont who, uh, who shall not be named, but he was terrible on Facebook and mean to women. Like, he was just, he was horrendous. And he searched through my Facebook and he must have gone back, I don't know, like four years, like ages looking for a bad picture. And there's a picture of me drinking a beer in my kitchen. And he's like, this is your new MLA. What a loser kind of deal. And that was my first taste of like, oh, well, this is, wow, is this what it's going to be like? And most people on there were like, shut up, man. (laughs) He's just a guy drinking a beer, right? And so I locked everything down and I was actually worried about my kids and my wife is what I was actually worried about. That's what I was about to ask you next. That was the thing. That could change for them too. Yeah. They're going to school, now their dad's 
happen in LA. For sure. So how did you prepare them? You know what? We just talked about it and my wife and I just said like, listen, if somebody says something stupid, you know, try to ignore it, right? Like, you know, your dad. I was like, you know who I am, guys. You can always talk to me. You can always ask me. I mean, they were young. I mean, they're nine and 11 now, right? So it was four years ago. They're still, you know, the youngest didn't really get it, right? And, and Declan was, you know, he's seven, six going on seven at the time. And he got it, but not, you know, real. Did they ever come home one day and say, dad, is this right? Are you doing something? No, that you know what? It was nice because they never did. You know, they never did, which I appreciated. And so that's actually for me, I was like, yeah, fine. Come at me. Give it to me. Like, I don't care. Right. But yeah, I, I kind of got a little worried because I saw that Facebook stuff. I shut it down. And then after that was not bad. I mean, you know, straight up, the women get it a billion times worse than us. And it's disgusting. Right. Like talk about raping them and killing them. Like, and it's absolutely horrendous. Me as a guy, as, as a straight white guy. Come on. I mean, it's <laughs> we have all the privileges in the entire world. Right. And so I wasn't worried about me, um, but I wasn't used to that hate and that kind of like. Because you must have seen ugh. some of your fellow caucus members get attacked. On oh, big time. Basis. Yeah. So was the caucus a family? You, if someone gets attacked, we're going to defend you. Oh, yeah, big because time. If, if someone attacks my family, I'm going to go out oh, yeah. blazing and just try to make sure that they're defended. Mm -hmm. Is that the same? Issue? Yeah, I really felt like that, honestly, from right, almost right from the get go. We were like that. And that's my nature, too. I've always been one of those people that likes to, um, and sometimes, you know, rightly or wrongly, I do when people don't really need it. But it's my nature to stand up and try to protect, too, right? And I felt like that with all of us that was like, no, we stood by each other and because it was super stressful, right? It was stuff that people hadn't done before other than, you know, the handful that had been MLAs before. But now in government, the light is shining on you so bright and they're looking for every crack and they're, you know, and, and so, no, I, I found that everybody, everybody stood by each other really well and, and tried to, um, we, we really tried early on to say, because we had social workers there too, right? Like people that understood looking if somebody was struggling. I found that was really nice that we all, a lot of hugs. <laughs> That's our nature anyway in the <laughs> yeah. NDP, uh, which Sandra Jansen found when she came over was like, oh my God, I've never been hugged this much in my life. And she's like, I love it. But I found that a lot. Yeah, it was a big family like that for sure. So at any time when you were running for the, when running in the election growing up, did you ever think to yourself, I want to be a minister of the crown never not once so what was that like to get that call to say hey <laughs> we're calling you up to the big leagues now you're going to be sitting around the table to make mm -hmm. major decisions what was that like you know it was uh it was nerve-wracking i'd had a couple of the mayors around here uh, that I worked very closely with say to me about a year in that, Hey, we think you're, you're going to get tapped at some point here and we're excited about it, but we also don't want it to happen because you won't be in your riding as much. Right. Uh, luckily living this close to Evan tonight, you know, I had the opportunity to deal with more, but and so I was always like, no, no, no. I just put my head down and work. That's my nature. It's what I do. No, nope, I don't care. But I was getting more opportunities to speak on behalf of other on behalf of other ministers. I was getting asked to do more. I had a feeling I might get asked to do a little more. I, I didn't know if that was going to be um, like deputy whip or whip or something along those lines. But then as as it went along in committees, right, I got more opportunity to do stuff and then they wanted me to be deputy in public affairs to be beside Derek yeah. you know and Derek and I get along so they so they knew that we you know we, I could handle them kind of thing and um, but then it was pretty funny because my wife kept saying stuff about it too she's like they're asking you to do way more and uh, John Haney called me on um, it happened super fast too right he called me on was it Thursday afternoon or Friday? Friday, I think it was. Called me on a Friday and said, hey, I'm calling you. To, we're going to vet you. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Right? I was freaking out. Right? I'm like, I know what you're talking about, but what are you talking about? Yeah. And he goes, we're, we're going to vet you and get your stuff to me over the weekend and, and all that kind of jazz, right? I said, oh my God, okay. Good, geez, okay, sure. So, so Monday, he says, uh, he's like, got all your stuff, we got to do, do a, a meeting with you. So we go in and meet and I'm up, up at the legislature 
and we're sitting in an office and he's asking me all those questions, right? All the stuff he's got to get into. And I remember You're talking, still not. and I'm still like, nah, there's not a chance in hell. Yeah. He's asking 25 different people. Thomas Dang walks in and I remember and he was like, what's good? What's going on? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm talking, right? Like, okay, you know, and he needs to basically like get out yeah. kind of thing. <laughs> and so, so whatever. So John says, okay, well, we'll, we'll get back to you. So I'm driving home. This is Monday afternoon. Now Kelly's got to work graveyard. Yep. I got to get back for the kids. There's crazy traffic. I'm like, oh my God, I got to get home. I'm stuck. Uh, I get a phone call. And it's Jen Anthony, and she says, hey, can you turn around right now? And I said, or said, can you come back to the legislature? Like, where are you? And I said, oh, I'm in traffic. I, well, I said, I can't. She's like, well, what do you mean? I said, well, I got to get home to my kids. She's like, no, you got to come around and talk to the premier. I said, I can't. And she, there was this pause, right? Like, That's you know, career yeah, right? Call, right. <laughs> and I, and I kind of thought, geez, I shouldn't have said that. Uh, but also, holy shit, I got to get home. Yeah. Like my kids need me. Right. Yep. And so she kind of paused and then she laughed and we had caucus the next day and she said, okay, well, I'll, I'll text you. And so we were texting, right. And she's like, okay, we're going to meet at this time, whatever. So I had to go to caucus and she's like, you can't tell anybody that you're talking to us and that you're going to talk to the premier. Yeah. Everybody was asking questions at caucus, right? Because everybody heard rumors and like people were, and not just me, they were all like whispering, like who's going on. And so then at lunchtime, I went and talked to Rachel and, and she forgot about this till I said something. I was starving. I could smell the food. Everybody was eating. I walk in the office and she's eating this delicious food. I can't remember what it was. And she's like, Hey, how's it going? I'm like, good. I'd be better if I had food. Right. And and so she starts this conversation almost like we were, you know, like had gotten cut off halfway through a conversation and about ministry and this, that, and the other. And I was like, Rachel, I don't, I don't know what's happening right now. Like, where are you, what's going on? She's like, looks at me like I have two heads, right? Like, what are you serious? And looks at Heaney and Heaney's like, I never told him anything. And then, so she, she backs up a bit about a quarter of a way through a conversation that we've never had and starts again. And I'm like, Rachel, I don't know what's happening right now. Like, am I getting some? Thing. She's like, yeah, municipal affairs, right? Like, just kind of like, you're an idiot. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I am an idiot. Like, you know, because I never thought, right? I didn't, I just thought that she wanted to talk me and kind of do a little more vetting. Um, so then I had to go back to caucus and not, and not tell anybody until I got home and I could tell my wife and my family, right? Yeah. Uh, because I was going to get sworn in the next day. Oh, geez. So it was like Friday to Wednesday, so fast. And we had another event on the Wednesday morning. There was like people from the airport and municipal officials all over the place chatting with me. And the guy from the airport's like, oh, yeah, uh, I got to talk to Danielle this afternoon uh, about some municipal stuff. And in my head, I'm like, <laughs> it's, it's going to be me. It's going to be me. All right. So, so yeah, I, I forgot, but you might be able to clarify. Did you get sworn in with anyone else? Were you with the group of five or? Yeah. You know what? Um, God, it's such a blur. And it was me. Well, Danielle was there because she was changing roles. Yeah. Uh, me, her, was that, I think Christina was there for labor that day. Okay. Uh, honestly, going on. yeah, my brain, like from that day, I was just like, I, I'd have to look back at pictures, honestly. So, yeah. So. Which sounds terrible, but it's, it's almost like wedding day where it's like, it was so crazy that I'm just kind of like, holy cow. You know, I kind of, yeah, it's a blur. <laughs> Municipal affairs is a big portfolio. Mm -hmm. That will take you away from your family and you're yeah. writing a lot. Mm -hmm. At any time when that conversation or quarter of a conversation or three quarters of a conversation that you're having with Rachel, mm -hmm. uh, did you think to yourself, I'm not going to be able to do this because I, I have a young family at home. I have a wife who works graveyard shifts. I, 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 I'm not sure. Or did you say, you know what? We're going to make this happen. Uh, I, I, my wife had said to me before, she said, because when they start to vet, yeah. right? And I said, what if they ask me? She goes, you take it. And I said, what do you mean? She's like, we'll make it work. Yeah. If they ask you to take a bigger role and if they ask you to be a minister and Rachel wants to appoint, you take it. And, and she's like, what an opportunity. And, and I, I knew that inside, but you know, 
I didn't want to put everything on her, right? And and because we don't have any family here. My brother and sister and all live in the city, but they're professionals too. So it wasn't like we have mom and dad real real close, right? And so I was like, geez, I don't want to put all that pressure on you with all the shifts. You, I mean, you work twelve hour shifts at the hospital. Like you save people's lives for God's sakes. Like, you know, I don't want to do that. But she just said nope. So when Rachel said it, it was kind of we'd already had that conversation. Um, and you know what? I didn't know all of the stuff that municipal affairs kind of had in the portfolio at the time. I knew parts of it, right, obviously, and, and working with uh, with Danielle a bit and Darren before that. But uh, but you're going to be driving around, so did you think about the riding at all? Because yeah. you're in a rural area, you're an NDP, you're essentially going, you're going into election, that's going to take you away from the riding. Yeah. So did that way at all? It, you know what? It, it did, it, you know, honestly, number one is family yeah. for me, right? And I mean, that's, like I said before, that's kind of one of the reasons why I did it was to try to help and show the family that you do that. But the um, the riding stuff, because my those couple of mayors had kind of said that stuff to me before, you know, it went through my mind, but... I was in the riding a ton. Like we have so much going on through Leduc and Beaumont and the, and the area and with the airport and NISCU and everything. There was a million things going on. And like, I never stopped because I loved it. Right. And, and the staff always made fun of me and in my, my constituency staff are like, listen, man, you can't say yes to everything. <laughs> like it's impossible. Right. And, and I, you know, I didn't get much sleep cause I was always at stuff. So I knew that people would kind of understand. And I also knew because my riding is very close to Edmonton that I could get out even on days when we're in session, I'd be back out here doing stuff. Right. So I knew that I would have that where it wasn't like Danielle up North or Marg up North or Debbie or somebody way down South, Lethbridge, like Shannon and Lethbridge, like, yeah, like these are, those are long ways, right? You can't just drive home after ledge. I knew I could, you know, on on certain days, obviously with the amount of things and responsibilities that you have, you can't do it all the time, but I knew I would have those opportunities or catch something early in the morning and then head up to the legislature. Right. So it, it went through my mind, but I knew I'd be okay. So one of the big pieces that you brought in was the new city charters. Mm -hmm. You're in municipal affairs. Are you proud of that document? Is there things that you would look, or you look back now and say, maybe I tweak a little bit here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know what? I am proud of it. It was, uh, it was interesting because there was, there was a big hoopla about it, but there kind of wasn't to, in a, in a way. Because I think from an, of what you're talking about is the taxes, right? Because I, of the sort of the right was saying, oh. Oh my God, they were crazy. Cities yeah. ability to tax whoever they want. And we weren't. Yeah. And it was never in the conversation and right from the get go. And, and cause I worked with Joe on it, right? Because of the, of the fiscal side of it. And it was never, we were all like, Hey boys, like this is not on the table. And, and Don and, and the head were good with that, right? They're like, yeah, we get it. Right. But there was other opportunities where, uh, you know, we could, you know, cut some red tape for them and do some things where um, it made it a little easier or, or open up ways for them to to use other tools that they had already. But it kind of brought it out to the forefront. Right. So the charter stuff to me was I mean, his, it was historic. No other province had two big cities like that. For one, um, the transit funding and things we were doing with it when we did. I mean, it was hard. It was tough. That conversation. I mean, Joe was involved. I was involved. Rachel was involved. Rachel's chief of staff, all of our chiefs of staff. I mean, it was, uh, it was in depth. Like it was, it was a massive undertaking. And I think we, we undersell how big that was sometimes. But when I look at it, it was awesome for those two big cities and the, and the fact, and the people living around it, to be honest, I think that what it would, what it did was it made, made everybody realize, um, how complicated these big cities are and what ability they had too, right? It was, you know, even stuff that I didn't know about, their ability is some of the things they could do and, you know, their municipally controlled corporations they have, things like that, right? And so it was, um, it was interesting to see what the opposition was trying to throw in there tax wise and all that, because they'd get the hotel associations freaking out and the realtors freaking out and the developers freaking out. And then we'd sit down with them and go, well, actually, that's not even what's happening. Here you go. And, and the funny part is they'd be like, really? Really? Because they're used to governments changing, you know, saying one thing and doing the other. Yeah. And and I found that a lot. We got painted with that brush a lot. 
in, in all respects, not just with the charters, but in so many things like that, where, you know, we were like, no, 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 we're, te- what we're saying to you is straight up, man. Like, this is what's happening. Yeah. So I found the charters was good like that. And, and then changes to the MGA as well. Right? Oh my God. The MGA is, was massive. Oh, I, like, like as a former municipal employee, I yeah. just remember the changes in our like council sort of just like yeah. vibrating. Like, oh yeah. Happened? Who, what are they going to do to us? Well, same thing, right? Like there was so much, um, there's so many people out there in particular in the opposition, they were misrepresenting facts, even though we would give them like all the facts and we would brief them on everything and they would still go out there because the MGA was, is so big. Right. And so they'd be like, Oh, you can't believe them. Like no way that they're actually doing what they say they're going to do. Right. And so we like, again, no politician does that. Yeah. Right. So that that. happened a ton. And, and then I'd get into a room and be like, nah, it's bullshit. Like, what are you talking about? Who told you? that like that's the stupidest thing i've ever heard and they'd be like oh well okay they said we, we were gonna do it <laughs> yeah right so so there was a bunch of stuff like that that happened and and i think you know one of the things that i see with the charters and the mga in, in particular um where a lot of it was talking about uh working with other municipalities that's the stuff that i am i think one of the things i'm most proud of and then I think that regardless of us winning or losing the last election, all these municipalities kind of breaking down some of their barriers and going, yeah, it actually does make sense for us to work with you on fire and policing or water and wastewater, which is unbelievably expensive, or on the rec centers and doing more cost sharing and things like that. And so that's kind of the part that I'm actually really excited about and, and happy about to, you know, when I was at AMA a couple weeks ago, talking to some people, I'm like, hey, are you guys doing X? Are you doing Z? Like, what are you doing? Yeah, we're still doing it. We're working. Awesome. Like that stuff to me is really cool because what it's actually doing is making politicians work together. One, to be more efficient, but in particular work for the people, which is what you should be doing. Right. So now knowing what you know now, 2019 didn't turn out to be the best election for the NDP. Would you have done anything differently in your ministerial job or as your ML, as in your MLA position to advance any causes or Mm -hmm. potentially push through a few more issues for municipal affairs that you thought maybe if we know now we could Mm -hmm. push it through yeah I mean I think there was uh, you know there's some kind of bigger things but also you know locally a couple things and in particular it was 65th Ave there was funding there that we set aside it was there from infrastructure we put it there I was working with the feds to get it and I've just heard now that it's like they feel Leduc feels like oh it's gone right they haven't heard anything the feds basically said no see you and then there's an election and the new provincial government has said boo and so that's frustrating because the transportation corridor and the economic development part of that and the safety part of it is a big deal. So I wish that maybe we could have pushed a little harder, a little sooner on that. We did what we could because there was so much going on. But when I look back, I think, shit, I wish I could have done a little more on there and I got it done sooner. Um, The other one for me was... um, well, what they call PACE, right? Which is property assessed clean energy. But that's kind of the American term for it. Ours was the clean energy uh, um, improvement program, clean energy. We changed the name a bunch of times. I always mess it up. But basically the one where people could do energy efficiency upgrades on their houses yeah. and it goes on their property taxes, right? And it works through the municipality and through Energy Efficiency Alberta. It's it's an incredible program. Uh, Edmonton was going to be the first ones to jump on it. And the amount of jobs, and not just urban, that was the big thing for me, was the fact that people in rural areas, didn't matter where you lived, you could do, you know, new hot water heaters, new windows, insulation, solar panels, all these different things. And if you couldn't afford the upfront costs, it was okay because you could pay, you know, monthly and, and, you know, whatever on your, your property taxes. But it was also creating lots of jobs. And so it was a whole big thing that, like, the industry was pumped about it. There was so many people that were excited about it. And it would help farmers and industry and residential. Like it was just like, it was such a good opportunity and, you know, going through some of the red tape and some of the, like the slow stuff that was going on. And because there was an election coming, it was like, it just, it didn't get going how I wanted it to. And I think that 
it was a non, even though the opposition tried to make it partisan and said all kinds of weird stuff that was not true again, but you know, that's not my nature. And so I didn't appreciate that, but it was a nonpartisan thing that would help like jobs all over the place and like really help people save on their bills. And, and so all of that stuff to me was exciting about it. And I just wish that we could have got it done sooner and then people could have seen some of that stuff working because it just, it would have been good for so many people. So I hope it, you know, at some point it comes forward again. Cause like I say, Edmonton was pretty keen on it. There's some other municipalities that were keen on it. Uh, so we'll see, like, I know it's back East. Nova Scotia does it. Uh, I think it's Toronto does it. A couple of Montreal, like a couple of places like cities that do it. Yeah. So eh, I hope it's coming, but you know, so Alberta. yeah, but with everything that's going on with the climate and you know, all that kind of stuff changing, I mean, we need to be better. Right. And it would have been good, clean jobs, good, good paying jobs, you know, for all kinds of trades people and, and in particular in rural areas, like it just would have helped people. So I'm frustrated by it. Can you tell? I can tell. You're <laughs> yeah. A little bit. So, um, uh, I don't know how to broach the subject, but we will. 2019 election. Rachel goes to the lieutenant governor, lieutenant governor, sorry, calls the election. You go out on the door and you start knocking on doors. What's the atmosphere like? Mm -hmm. Is it different than 2015? Is it because at this time you have Jason Kenney in the opposition, Mm -hmm. you have misinformation being spread? No. (laughs) So when you start knocking on doors, do you see, oh no, this is going to be an uphill battle for us? Mm -hmm. Or what's the atmosphere? Oh, 100%. Yeah, without a doubt. Uh, It was uh, frustrating as hell, to be honest, because the amount of work we did, uh, the amount of jobs, like through when oil tanked in 2014 and then continue to go down. I mean, the global market, like, like I love this free market capitalist folks that love the free market, love capitalism when it's going well for them. But when it does what the free market does and it's shitty and nobody wants people to lose jobs. And that's, that's the part that I hated. They're like, Oh, you guys want people to lose jobs. Are you kidding me? Like I'm a blue collar guy. Do you think I like people losing jobs? No, none of us do. And so it was really hard because we worked so hard to like build infrastructure and put these programs in place, social, you know, programs, programs and stuff like brought child poverty down. Like that was crazy that people don't talk about it. So we do all these things with renewable energy where it's the cheapest in North America to put in like all these big companies are like, heck yeah. Like, you know, to me, I'm like, we're an energy superpower. We're not just oil and gas. Great that we have that. And it's got us to where we are. It's fantastic. The world's changing. How do we keep ahead of the curve? Right. We can do geothermal and bioenergy and solar and wind and like, let's go guys. And, and so we were doing a lot of these really good things things and in particular in rural areas that were helping them. And then you get on the doors and, and people were like, what? No, 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 they didn't give a shit. They were mad about equalization, which they were completely and still are completely missing. I'd listened to the, the uh, federal um, debate, debate, not the federal one, he, uh, the federal one here with yeah. our candidates. Yeah. You know what? The misinformation on equalization and how it works drives me insane. Is the formula perfect? Yeah. you know, no. It's not perfect. It, you know, the Harper government put it in under Kenny, who okayed it with the prime minister in Calgary and his right hand man in Calgary, who didn't give a shit about Alberta, never did and took it for granted. And that's actually part of the part that really upsets me is they take Alberta for granted, all the incredible things and all the incredible people are here. And, and people just, they don't seem to, to see it. Right. And, and it, and it kills me. Cause I'm like, Oh, you're better than that. Like you're like, I don't care what political party you are, but these guys are taking advantage of you. Right. And so when I hear this stuff about equalization on the doors, I'm like, actually guys, that's not how it's working. No, Quebec's taken and all. I'm like, like the other, right. And like, yeah. Oh, we're giving all this money. I'm like, no, we, I've lived in multiple provinces and, and you know, like this is how these things work. And you know, is it great? No, but can we work on it? Yes. And we should. And, and so you'd hear that and you'd hear pipelines. Right. And in particular, my area with Leduc and Nisku, right. With a lot of industry and stuff and it's high on everybody's minds and I get it. I'm not naive. I'm not stupid it's tough. People were scared, right? They were scared for their jobs and their families. And we heard it nonstop, but I, I don't know if we could have got through the opposition's rhetoric because they said things that were short, 
quick bursts that that inflamed people and got people worried and upset. It's the Twitter. Yeah, the, they were able to. Yeah, uh, and they're very good at it. Capitalized. Hundred percent, man. They're they're way better than anybody in the center left. The right has always been good at that, and I'll give them credit in that. Uh, that being said, I think it's unacceptable to play on people's fears. It is disgusting when you do that for votes. I think it's. I didn't think it's disgusting at any point. I don't like that. Um, talk about our policies. Let's talk about our policies. Let's go on facts and, and logic and, you know, it's easy to say, but it's not always the case. But once emotion gets involved, we saw it with Bill 6, once emotion gets involved, you're, it's, you know, you're going uphill in a, in a tough way. And so I found that really hard on the doors that there were a lot were of... able to convert people at the door when they... Went, once they oh, talked to me, there, yes. there was, you know, really good opportunities there I found where you would, you would get somebody at the door or you would see them in a venue where they could talk to you and ask you questions. And then it was like, oh, okay. Gee, I, I read this online. I'm like, well, that's the, thank you for asking, you know, and, and, and I'd have some people that say, well, um, I didn't vote for you last time. I'm like, I don't, I don't care. Like, what's your issue? What's the problem? And they'd say, well, I'm not sure if I'm going to vote for you this time. I'm like, well, if I am lucky enough to be an MLA, the MLA again, what's the problem? Like, how do I, how do I know? And they'd be like, oh my God, well, okay. I've never had actually somebody want to know that. And so it, it was tough. Um, cause my nature is to try to help yeah. and I get, you know, fired up and emotional and I care about stuff and all of us did. Right. And I think that was part of the part that, that hurt the most is, is like you put so much time and effort into it and you try so hard to work for people. Like we built four new schools here and, and modified and we were in the middle of modifying two or modern to them and do all this infrastructure and economic development, working with the airport, all these crazy things that are awesome for the riding. And people are just like, oh, hey, the pipeline's not built. And I'm like, you know who that's going to help? Corporations, like realistically, like our people are going to work on it for a bit. And in the end, like there's other things that are going to be longer term that we're working on. Like, like let's let's work together. And, and so, yeah, it was tough. Um, there was a lot of positive out there, too. But I mean, it, it was hard. It was different. Do you find that the election, that was a big rant? The, no, hey, I like it. Um, you, you, you said you like talking. It's good for a podcast. If you're a visual guy, it wouldn't work out that well. Let's be honest. Yeah. Um, 2015 electorate and the 2019 electorate were two different electorates. Oh, yeah. Do you find, and you might be, you, I, I think I know the answer already. Do you think that Alberta is a more divided province now than it was in 2015? Hmm. You know, that's tough to answer. It, when we, after we got elected, where I had people that had said, we wouldn't even put up an NDP sign, right? And I thought after, and, and a lot of people weren't involved. And then the, the, I can't remember the voting percentage, but it was garbage, right? It wasn't very high. And I'm like, God, this sucks, right? Like, why are people not involved? Like, even when people said, yeah, I don't care, like, I don't care about politics. I don't, I'm like, but it cares about you, yeah. right? Like it affects you, right? And, and so I found that after that, I was excited because I felt people were talking about it more and they were having more open conversations. But then as this rhetoric ramped up, you know, and when Kenny came here, like, honestly, he's one of the guys why I got into politics. Uh, I don't care about um, what party he's in. He's not in it for the people. He never was. He never has been. And I don't understand how people get fooled by that. Uh, he's just not. He just isn't. You know, I have a lot of other words I would say about it. Uh, I'll try to keep it, you know, fairly. <laughs> yeah. It just he is not a human that I think is out there for anybody else. And, and I and it disgusts me, to be honest. And, and so once he got here, though, you look at what he did to take over the PC party and then to merge that party. And then when he came into the house, what those MLAs, the way that they turned and how they started speaking. Holy mo- so did, you could tell night and day, us. night and day. Oh, my God. Night and day. Yeah, without a doubt. So uh, the Iron Fist. PC uh, combined. Oh, yeah. Iron Fist. If you if you did not say what he wanted, like the way he moved people right in the back and like, you know, when Fildebrand got booted and, and granted he should have been the way, he, you know, the little stuff that went on. <laughs> but, you know, like some of the other people, like. Uh, For me, like, I'll be honest, I have uh, 
Uh, this is the most contentious issue between me and my husband. I, I'm an old PCer. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Richard Starkey is a friend of mine. Mm-hmm. I interviewed him a few times when I was in Lloyd Minster. We became really good friends. Uh, I think he's a good, upstanding member. Yeah. Uh, when I saw him leave that party and stay with the PC, mm-hmm. good for you. You're yeah, yeah. Principal. Yeah. But what I saw him do to what I saw Kenny do to Star- uh, Richard. Was- oh yeah. No, I, I and I agree with you. Like Dr. Starkey had principal, and and I I said that to him right and I appreciated that um, we talked a couple times uh, about that that type of thing and but you could tell right and and so you could tell the way when he came in the way like just the condescending attitude the the, the smirks on his face and the way he took over and they're like oh we got free votes bullshit you never had one free vote you guys had to say exactly even when their members would speak you could tell it wasn't their voice right and and then I get that in a party sometimes you have to behind the scenes you talk about some things and then you have to show a united front i get that i'm not dumb i'm not naive but i found that the the tone of the province and this whole um communist socialist you guys are the worst you want to take everything from us and and give it to the east and and trudeau's the worst and oh my god the feds and like this whole western separation thing where kenny's like i'm a federalist bullshit you're stoking people's fear and their anger and and you have since the beginning and you love it you smirk and you giggle about it you know you give your mla's earplugs like are you serious like what kind of person does this right and so not and it's not just him I'm not, I, I shouldn't make it sound like that. It wasn't just him. He's a very smart individual. And if anybody says he isn't, they, they haven't met him. Uh, there's a reason why he is where he is, right? And I don't like the way he's gotten there. I don't appreciate that because he's dishonest. And, uh, and you can see it with all these RCMP investigations and all the things that are going on. But it's this whole, it's like Trump down south, right? Like it's this whole just fake news and, and I'll say all kinds of lies and misinformation to show you a shiny thing over here so I can do, the, you know, on the other side, I can do bad things or do things that are going to get me elected and 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 trick the electorate, right? And, and it's frustrating because I, he stoked people's fears and he still does and he gets them inflamed uh, and he's good at it, right? And... You know, I. So, how does the left become good at it? Well, we can't do that, right? We we cannot do that. I think that's. Well, I mean, you know, we've had people that have gone kind of that way, and and it doesn't go well. Like our, we had some kind of attack ads and stuff like that in our campaign. Like not mine personally, but as as a, as a party, and I know people in my writing were. They didn't like it. They didn't want it, especially the old school folks didn't like it. Um, I felt like we were giving him too much airtime. He didn't need it. He had enough anyway. The media was all over him. They gave him whatever airtime he wanted. It was ridiculous. He was an opposition leader. He didn't deserve all this airtime he was getting. Did you think that he treat, they, the media treated him more as a premier figure? Than 100%. Opposition? 100% they did, without a doubt. Because he was coming in as this federal cabinet minister that came out here to ride in and save the day for conservatives in Canada which is exact, exactly the way he portrayed himself. Um, and I think that, you know, I don't think that we on the left, center left even, should fall prey to that. Negative ads, uh, I don't agree with them. I never have. It's not who I am personally. Um, I don't think the majority of the electorate like that. Can you point out facts and can you um, show the differences and in contrast? 100%. And you should do that kind of stuff. But I don't think you should give the opposition any more airtime than than that, right? You have small points of that. Talk about what you've been doing and what you are doing and what you're going to do. People want to know that. Good, bad, or ugly, be straight up and honest with them and tell them, right? Like, don't don't just bash. You know, I had a, a guy that I know I talked to that said that to me. He's like, oh, I, I voted for you last time, but I didn't vote for you this time because uh, you guys were bashing them. I'm like, you mean the fear-mongering part where we were pointing out all of the horrible things that were actually true? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, seriously, like, even though it was us pointing out and not like, you know, not being negative in the, like saying, making stuff up, we're like, holy cow, guys, this is what they said. Like, this is an actual quote yeah. from them, from the X member. And then, and people will go, well, whoa, you're, you're being negative. And I'm like, I'm like, are you serious? Like this guy just said this, you know, like. 
talking about stuff that they would say in the house even. Yeah, but the one thing that I found was uh, when we were door knocking, either up in the north or down in Calgary, it was, well, he said it 20 years ago. Mm. How can you hold something against someone 20 years ago? Yeah. And I I get that, right? Because, Mm -hmm. A, I've gone through it because I said something back in 2010 when my fiancé died and uh, I sort of had to apologize. I did apologize for Mm -hmm. it in 2015 when I ran federally. Um, But I look at it and I go, okay, they held me against five, ten years ago, mm-hmm. but we can't hold conservatives for something they said 20 years ago. Yeah. So how did you overcome that? Because that was the biggest one that I heard. Yeah. 20 years ago, he's changed his mind. Everyone yeah. changes their mind. You know, and, and I did hear that a bunch of times. Oh, well, you can't. I'm like, really? I said, when has he ever apologized for it? Have you, have you heard him ever apologize? I said, that's fine. Like, we all do stupid things and we all have in our lives and, and, and said dumb things that we shouldn't have hey, said. you drink a beer in your kitchen. Yeah, like, <laughs> I'm the worst <laughs> human on the planet. But uh, speaking of that, I need another beer. Um, <laughs> the uh, But that was the thing for me. I was like, okay, well, has he apologized? Has he come out and said, yeah, I was wrong? No, he hasn't. Right. And so to me, that that goes a long way. And you show by your actions. Right. If you said one thing at a certain point in time, but then your actions after show that you were trying to make up for that and you realize that you maybe you were wrong and you should be better. That goes a long way. Right. And it was tough, though, because so many people were just like they were believing what was going on, you know, and I heard a person say that you guys destroyed the economy and I'm like, oh my God, actually there's this going on and there's this and is it perfect for everybody? No, not by any stretch, but you know, um, will it be perfect under the other guys? Yeah, it never was. It's never been right. Like, and, and so I I say that to people, I'm like, yeah, it's never going to be perfect. Um, but if you can talk to the government, you can talk to the people that are, that are elected and, and actually let them know what's going on and they're trying to work on it I mean that should go a long way right and and so and four years isn't a long time either right and so go by in the flash? oh crazy it seemed like it was a million years but it seemed like it went by and all of a sudden you were just like oh my god like I remember my dad saying to me he's like take a journal He's like, you're not going to remember all this stuff. I said, yeah, 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 whatever, dad. Typical, right? The things that you don't have, like your parents say to you. Yep. And you're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And then I look back and go, shoot, I wish. Because there's been times since where people say something. I'm like, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Or, you know, forgot about this. And, and yeah, it went by real fast. Yeah, real fast. Looking to the future. So you got defeated in the 2019 election. I did? Shit. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Yeah, do back in Edmonton uh, tomorrow morning. Yeah. Um, <laughs> do you know how many people actually will be like, hey, so how's everything going? I'm like, I lost. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Not a lot of people, but the odd person. I'm like, seriously? But every every time I talk to one, like a former politician or anyone who has been in the public eye, they say the exact same thing to me. People still come up to me and say, so when can I come talk to you about a certain yeah. issue? Yeah. Uh, I'm not your MLA anymore. Yeah. And it sucks because and then it's like, man, you really don't pay attention. Yeah. Like, that's what I feel like. You know, a guy in my ball team said that. And I'm like, seriously, dude? I'm like, I... <laughs> I see you all summer. Like, what are you talking about, man? Did you think I'd be doing He's like, all? oh, shit. Oh, yeah, well, I hadn't seen you, you know, so I didn't know. And I was like, okay, well, chat, you don't live in my riding, so fair, okay. <laughs> but I'm like, but I'm like, I've known you for like 10 years, man. So, but yeah. <laughs> so uh, you go back to tell us. Open arms? Were they happy to have? Oh yeah, yeah. You're in a new Excuse position me. now too, right? Yeah. So you know, for tell us one of the nice parts there, and there's lots of companies that will do it, and and uh, with the contract and stuff, where municipal, provincial, federal, I was on a leave, right? Yeah. And so, um, I knew they they held the job for me as a technician. <laughs> So I wasn't worried in that sense. I've never worried about work ever in my life. I've always, I'll do whatever it takes to feed my family, right? And my wife's got a phenomenal job and she's super educated and incredible what she does. So I wasn't worried, you know, for the interim. So it was nice because Telus was like, yeah, yeah, take your time. Like, if you want to come back, of course, we have your job here. And, and they were really great the whole four years. They were pumped, right, that they had had a, a technician that was, uh, you know, a minister. And same as my union was pumped about that, right? It was it was good. It was a, it was a great relationship. And so 
you know, I took a few months over the summer where it was, um, you know, come to terms with it. And also, uh, my kids were just finishing school and we were playing a lot of baseball and I was going out with them doing that. And I was playing a lot of fastball. And, and so it was, you know, it was a good, good summer like that and had a family reunion. And then, uh, unfortunately my one father-in-law passed away, which was really, yeah, it was really shitty. It was a sickness that happened really quick. And, uh, but being off gave us the opportunity to be with the family a lot, which was kind of a blessing in disguise, right? So it was nice to be able to do that. And Telus was, like I said, was just like, hey, no worries. My general manager was like, take your time. What do you want to do? And so when I started talking about going back, they said, okay, well, that's what do you want to do? And I said, well, I'm not climbing poles in minus 30 anymore. So <laughs> I've kind of done a few things. I might know a couple of things that might help. And so we said, okay, well, what should we do? And, and we decided because of all the connections I made and things and, and because I was a minister, I'm on a year cooling off period. So some stuff with municipalities I can't technically do right. And particular lobbying, which I didn't want to do anyway. So we thought, okay, well, let's work with chambers of commerce. I'm like, yeah, I know tons of them. I'm like, you guys don't really get out to engage with them very much why don't we do that and so i've been building this kind of process to work with chambers and i've been reaching out to them and and a lot of them around the northern alberta to start and a lot of them just been like what oh geez okay that's cool like you know because i said things are changing like 5g and fiber like there's a lot of things happening that are changing communities out there i want you guys to know what telus is doing and so i i told the gm that and we we just thought yeah why not let's do this right it'll get get so us out in communities so telus just announced the big uh, partnership with the Alberta government yeah so that must be well you know what and it's not a partnership either oh so you say that well it's interesting because they passed it off like a partnership well well, the government, yeah, I know that, yeah. <laughs> and I got to be careful in the way I say that, yeah. right? Like, so tell us is actually, I will say that even after we won the election in 2015, they had come out and said, you know, there was businesses that were like, oh, you know, we're not going to invest in Alberta, blah, blah, NDP. I'm like, whatever, guys, like, get real. Yeah. And then they invested in Alberta. <laughs> but tell us came out right away and was like, nope. We, we believe in Alberta. Like we work with every government's here and we're going to invest. And so they had been investing billions of dollars anyway. And they had said the la- the fourth quarter, like you can look it all up. It was all online um, that they were going to be investing this. But the announcement was a good opportunity to tell that story is what it was. And of course, for the province, of course, I mean, they were pumped, right? That a big company like Telus, who's doing so much in all these communities, wanted to do a big event. So of course they did, right? I mean, I don't fault anybody for wanting to do that i mean it's it's exciting when i look at it i go holy crap look at the amount of money and and time and effort we're going to put into the province this is cool like and i think back to the municipalities and go oh my god this is gonna be awesome for municipalities right this is gonna be so good for businesses and people and and so my mind goes to that you know and I, i try to not think about the political part of it because really i mean it's not it's nothing to do with the politics it's nothing to do with the government in that respect it's tell us is just saying we believe in it and we're going to do it, which I appreciate. Right. And they've done that continuously. And that's actually part of what I wanted to tell the story of was like, Hey, do you guys realize how much money tells puts in like, like St. Albert, like over a hundred million dollars are doing in, in a fiber infrastructure really? build. Yeah. So like you look, I said this to the, to our CEO, I said, well, think about it. I said, look at Rogers center. I said, so what are the naming rights cost? What a hundred million dollars? I said, so instead of doing that, which of course we had the opportunity because all the big corporations did, I said, what do we do instead? We're putting it in this community that's going to help all these businesses and homes and entrepreneurs and and the municipality for years to come. I said, have we told people about that? He's like, that's a good point. I'm like, exactly. You have to start telling the story. Yeah, right. And so I'm excited like that about that stuff. Like regardless of the event with the, the government, the government's a government. Of course, they're pumped about it, right? Like we would have been too, yeah. right? But uh, but it must yeah. be nice now to be back home at night from time to time. Oh, yeah. Seeing your kids. It's weird. <laughs> My kids were like, uh, why are you home? Are you leaving? That's what the kids <laughs> say to me. Why are you home? Well, you don't like me home? You little poops? Like, seriously? Yeah. What are you guys doing behind my back? Yeah, I'm like, interesting. What's mom sleeping off graveyard? What are you doing here? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's been weird. Um, have you ever asked this to anyone? Because I'm, uh, I've talked to uh, most of them have grown kids. But if your kids ever came to you one day and said, hey, I want to run for politics, would you support them? 100%. Yeah. Yeah, without a doubt. Like, it is... 
it's not for everybody. That's for sure. Uh, it's, it's tough. I think sometimes people go into it and this is what I had a lot of young municipal politicians would want to ask me questions. Right. And, and I'm like, this is not for everybody guys. Like it's, it's different than municipal too. Right. Obviously. But if you have a passion for it and you want to try to help people, why not? Why not try it? Like, like I said, worst thing that's going to happen, you're going to lose, but you know, or maybe it's winning. I don't know if that depends on how you look at it, but you know, if you're, if you're passionate about that, you want to do it, then yeah. Like, you know, do it for the right reasons though. That that's my, my biggest thing when I talk to people, like, cause I've had people locally that have asked me, right. And they want to sit down for coffee and, and pick my brain on politics. And it, to me, it's just like, well, why do you want to do it? What's your reason? And it shouldn't be about, you know, this last election when the UCP was like, take back and power. Well, if people are using those words, they're not in it for the right reason, right? They're not there because they want to actually help people. They want to be there in their shiny position and pretend that they have power that, you know, hey, do you have, you know, a lot of responsibilities and a certain amount, I guess, power, like, I don't like the word power for it, but is it an MLA? I guess, but that's not the reason, right? And so if my kids want to do it, I would ask them why. And then, yeah, I would stick behind them for sure. And would you instill, are you going to instill the same values that your father instilled in you about democracy? Yeah, for sure. You don't care who you vote for as long as you Yeah, I, I want people to, I would want them to get out and vote. I want them to be informed. That's a big one for me. It's, you got to get informed, man. Like some people go and vote. Like I was at a, I think it was a municipal election last time and there was a couple in front of me and he's like, who do I vote for? And his wife's like, Shh, dear, you're voting for this. And I was like, really, man? Like you didn't even like take the 30 seconds to read the newspaper where they were talking about their platforms, you know? And so that to me is, is frustrating. And so as long as my kids would go out and read about it and get informed. And, and you know what, to be honest, kids these days are way better informed than we were way better. Like when there's this whole thing right now where I think Jug me was talking about taking the age down to 16 to vote. Totally do it. People are like, well, they don't even know. Do you know? Really? 50 year old person. You, Tell me then about what you know about the, the issues at hand. Because I was just in that school and talking to that class, and the questions they had were absolutely astounding how intelligent really? they were. Every time I went to a high school, and not even just high schools, even like grade six classes, the questions that kids were asking me, the things that they care about, looking to the future, like you, I think that, you know, I think it was... I think Kenny was, he had made fun of kids uh, a while back. It was before the election about the youth not knowing or dismiss them or whatever. And I'm like, you do that at your own peril. Like, look at all the climate stuff that's going on right now. The younger generation are so intelligent and and the access to information, the things they know, and you're going to dismiss that. (laughs) I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. Right. Like this, this next, uh, provincial election is going to be a lot different. The questions, I think the questions are going to be asked. The, The problem is, is when you look at the age categories and who votes the most, it's 55 and up. Yeah. And it always has been. And they say now this year is the biggest block is millennials. Well, millennials go through a big age range, right? Like, I think it's up to what, 38 year olds now or something like that? Yeah, somewhere it's, yeah, I think it's, it's older now, which I was quite surprised in, right? That's a lot of professionals, a lot of, not even just, I don't, I shouldn't use the word professional. A lot of people have been around and have lived experiences that have seen and heard things and, and know what's going on. And so to dismiss them and to dismiss younger generations, I think is wrong and it's not going to turn out well for people. Because I was going to say, um, the, your generation, I, mean, I think you're a little bit older than me, like <laughs> five, ten years I'm 44 now, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Ten years older than me. When you, I look at, you know, a really solid at, 32 I was right now. Say 22, but yeah. like, oh, 32 is I okay. like it. I like it. Um, but the generation that I grew up with and you grew up with are two different generations. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, my generation grew up, we, we were on the cusp of the uh, climate change action mm. slash uh, uh, GSA. Yeah, yeah. Because I remember going to school and I do not 
not remember even someone uttering the word GSA because if you did, you got beat up. Mm-hmm. I'm assuming that's the same with you. It yeah. might be different in BC, but in rural yeah. Ontario, I know that was the case. I don't even remember anybody even saying them, that word. Exactly. Man. So when you look at your kids and how politically active their classmates are, mm-hmm. the engagement is, do you think... and conservatives will attack me when I say this, uh, that the NDP government would come back. Yep. I do. I, I, I say that not because, you know, where, where people will go, oh, you're you're indoctrinating them. You're, you know, you're trying to pull the wool over their eyes and this, that, and the other. If people caring about our environment, if people care about, you know, seniors getting good health care and, and, you know, anybody with disabilities being taken care of and having opportunities that they should have and, and indigenous people having all the same rights as the rest of us, which they bloody well should. And it's been too goddamn long where they've been treated like second class citizens. Uh, and, and all these things that these kids believe in, cause they don't, they don't understand all these divisions. They don't care, right? They don't care who you, who you love or what your religion is or where you came from. Why would they give a shit? No, exactly. They care about, uh, doing things right. Being honest. You see that so much more, right? And you know, people go, oh, a bunch of snowflakes or they'll say all these things. And, and, and it frustrates the hell of me. Why is it, why, why is it bad to care about people? Why is it bad to care about your environment? Why is it bad to want to do better for people and take care of the fucking community that you live in? And kids these days want to do that. And so if there's, and like I know a lot of PC people that are good, good people. And, and don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say it's either, you know, you're one side or the other. With, the yeah, yeah, like I don't want to say that. But I do think that when people make fun of this social justice warrior and all this bullshit, why is that bad when people want to stand up for other people's rights? That's a good thing. You know, you try to say, oh, I pull myself up by your bootstraps. Bullshit. Sure, you worked hard. Totally, completely. I'll give that to you. Everybody had help from somebody at some point. It might have been physically. It might have been financially. It might have been mentally. It doesn't matter. We all help each other. And the sooner we realize that we have a hell of a lot more in common than we don't, the better off our society is going to be. And I think that more and more kids are like that these days because they see it's the right way to be, right? And it doesn't matter your political stripe. I don't give a shit about that. It matters about being a human and a good human, right? And that's really it. And that's my last question is right here. In the four years that you were in power, did you stand by that saying? A human is a human, doesn't matter what political stripe. You may, you tried to make Alberta better for all Albertans mm-hmm. and not just the NDP friends. Yeah, 100%, without a doubt. If you... If I didn't, I'd uh, I feel terrible about it, right? There's a reason why when I got in there, I read everybody's biography in the House. I firmly believe that that last legislature we had, 87 people in there, it most represented Alberta, like, that we've ever had. Uh, you know, doctors and lawyers and farmers and technicians. technicians and students and business people and you name it, we had it. And I became friends with people on the opposition benches. Uh, Derek and I are still friends. Phil Brandt and I, Cooper and I are friends, right? Like there, there's people that you, you see those connections with it and you need to do that. Right. And if I did stuff, I'm not, I've never been hyper partisan. It's, I don't, I don't believe that if you're like that and that's fine if people are, but if you're only that and you can't see past that to try to work with another member or something, I think you're not doing right by the people, you know, to be honest. And, and I tried my best to be that way um, as much as I could, because I think that's if you're in it, like I said, for the right reasons, you're trying to help people, then you're going to do that. Right. So awesome. Jay, thank you very much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. No problem, man. <laughs> Sorry I like to rant a little bit, hey, but yeah, it was <laughs> I love it. I love when people want to talk because like I said, I've learned so much in the last hour and well, fifteen minutes that uh, I never got like I could have read interview after interview with you and mm-hmm. I never have gotten the passion that I got out of you because uh, one thing I hated as a journalist was cutting down the hour long interview with mm. thirty second sound bites. Yeah. So Yeah. Thank you again. No problem. <laughs> 
And thank you very much yet again to our guest today and to you, the listeners. Uh, as I've said in the past, without listeners, we wouldn't be able to do this podcast. So thank you very much. If you haven't already, like us on Facebook, like us on Twitter, follow us on Instagram. Uh, just we want to get our word out that we're just starting an open conversation, an open and honest conversation with everyone. Uh, we're trying to get away from the 140 character tweets and start that conversation conversation thank you very much once again like us subscribe to our podcast so with that you've been listening to the cross-border interview podcast a subsidiary of miranda brown and associates incorporated thanks very much and have yourself an excellent week and we'll see you back here next saturday for another episode of the cross-border interview podcast